Amen, man. You guys sound good this morning. Everybody glad to be here? Yeah, I am so glad you guys are here, man. I love it. Uh, our worship team is just so unbelievably talented. I'm so grateful for them, the way they lead us in worship. Yeah, y'all can clap for them. Well, I'm glad that you are here this morning as well. If you don't know who I am, my name is Ben Lofton. I do have the privilege of getting to serve as one of the pastors on staff here. And I know that uh, you have seen me for the last few weeks, and some of you might be thinking, why? Um, I am not uh, uh, the lead campus pastor here. That is our pastor, Pastor Matt Darby. Uh, he and his family are currently out on sabbatical right now. So they're spending several weeks uh, just getting some rest and getting some much needed and deserved time with one another. But also, Pastor Matt is seeking uh, the face of the Lord and to hear his voice uh, and to get a, a fresh vision for what it looks like for our church and our campus to move uh, into the future. So uh, as he comes to your mind over the, over the coming days, I would ask that you would pray for him. Pray for him. Pray for his family. Pray that God would give them rest uh, uh, in him, that God would provide everything that they need a while uh, that they are out, and that he would speak uh, to Pastor Matt very clearly uh, as he is seeking God's voice in this time. So I'm excited for them. I know they're getting a lot of great rest, so just continue uh, uh, to pray for them. If you're uh, new here, or maybe this is your first time coming to New Beginnings, I want to tell you how grateful I am that you're here and you've chosen to worship with us. If you haven't had time uh, to stop by one of our uh, new here tents or our desk in the lobby, make sure that you swing by there. We would love to have a record of your welcome. We have a pretty cool gift for you, too. We'd love for you to have. And uh, we can also tell you how to get more deeply connected here to life at New Beginnings. So make sure that you swing by there and, and let us know that you were here. Well, we are in week four of our study in Habakkuk. This uh, sermon is series has been titled A Nation in Turmoil. I was talking to some deacons this morning. I told them, I said, for a book that's only three chapters long, it feels like we have been in it for a very long time. Uh, it's actually the fifth week uh, since we started it. We had the one week of Father's Day that was a break here. Uh, but we are moving into our fourth, our fourth week. And what we've seen, the other three sermons, is we've seen really a, a, a discussion between Habakkuk and God about justice that's to come for God's people, the justice that's going to come for the wicked nation of Babylon, because God's going to use Babylon uh, to conquer God's people and bring, uh, uh, bring uh, revival and bring justice to them. And then last week we talked about the five woes, just an incredibly cheerful passage of Scripture where God talks about how he's going to do all this awful stuff to uh, uh, the Babylonian Empire at, uh, down in the future, right? So he says, I'm going to use them for my purposes here, but here, woe to them who do these things because this is how they're going to end up and this is what's going to happen. We made the statement that for God's people, we're called to trust God's plan even when we don't understand God's process. So Habakkuk has shown us that God sees sinfulness and injustice, and he's going to deal with it. Regardless of what it takes to deal with it, regardless of how long it takes to deal with it, God will deal with it. So there's really the, the idea that we are to wait on the Lord in there, right? He says, I don't, it's not going to happen right now, Habakkuk, but I'm going to deal with it. So he says, wait on the Lord. Then we get to the foundational statement of the book of Habakkuk where he says, uh, God's people, the righteous, will live by faith. And last week, I alluded to the fact that this week we get to make the turn. Everything is uh, uh, moving up and to the right at this point. If you're a graph person, you know that thing is going from down here to up here. We find this often in the Bible where you see uh, that God, we, they talk about God's justice and God's judgment, and it feels really heavy, but then we know it's coming. We know that turn is coming back towards encouragement and God's faithfulness and God's power. And that's what we're going to see uh, today as we begin chapter 3 uh, of the book of Habakkuk. The title for the sermon this week is, is called A Prayer of Hope. Many of your Bibles might even say that as the header over uh, the first part of chapter 3. And as I thought a little bit about the word hope this week, I thought, you know, hope's really an interesting concept. Depending on what group of people you're in and depending on how you're saying the context with which you use the word hope, it really has a different meaning and a different connotation. We use it all the time here in the church, and we should. But I think out in the world, when they say hope, I think it means something a little bit differently. So many of us will say, let's say you're going out for dinner uh, with your family and you're going to go to a place that you've never been before. What do you say? I hope this restaurant is good. I hope. I hope it's good. Your kids are in school and you say, I hope my son or my daughter are, have prepared and they do well on the test. I really, I really hope that that happens. I hope uh, that my spouse doesn't get home and get angry when they see all the Amazon packages on the front doorstep. 
I just hope they're excited about it as I am, right? I hope, Richard, I hope that the Cowboys win the Super Bowl this year. I hope. Now, obviously, some of those hopes are a little more realistic than other ones. I'm not going to point to which one isn't. But what's the common denominator in all those statements? It sounds like a question, right? Whenever you even say those things, there's a question mark at the end of the way that you say it. It's more like we're wishing these things to happen, and we don't have hope that they're going to happen. So we just kind of cross our fingers and go, man, I hope it works out. It's going to be okay. There is an uncertainty underneath all of those statements when we use the word hope in that way. But when we thought when, for the believer... For us, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you follow him and you belong to God, there is no question mark at the end of the sentence when we use the word hope. There is none. When we talk about the things of God, we don't wish things would happen. We hope, we have hope that they will. The difference in those two things is certainty. We have certainty. My hope is underpinned with certainty. There is no wish factor involved in my hope. The definition of hope that I have written down here is a a biblical definition. For the believer, it says hope is the sure and confident expectation of receiving what God has promised in the future. Sure and confident expectation. You see, hope for those that belong to God is never a question. It's always a declaration. It's never a question. I'm never wondering if it's going to happen. I'm declaring my hope in it because I know it is going to happen. And today, that's exactly what we see in the book of Habakkuk as we begin in chapter 3, verses 1 through 16 is where we're going to be today. If you do have your Bible, you can go ahead and start making your way there to Habakkuk 3. And the first thing I'd point out about this is kind of unique passage of Scripture to where we've been in the book. This is really written as a psalm. It's written as a song. It's written as a prayer. It's very different than uh, the, the, the chapters that came before it. Some scholars that I read said that Habakkuk wrote this when he penned it. The intention would be is that it was certainly his prayer, but it would be one that God's people used moving forward as they dealt with uh, the, what was to come, as they dealt with the struggle, as they dealt with uh, uh, dealing with the Babylonians and all that would come to God's people. He thought they would continue to use that. They would recite it and they would sing these words as they waited and hoped in the Lord to deliver them. And I saw when I read through it, I believe the scripture breaks down in two sections, even though it's a lot of verses. I think there's two main ideas in it. And there's two postures that I think that we can gather from this that's useful for us and we need to root ourselves in as believers. Uh, The first thing that we see Habakkuk doing in these verses, in verses 2 through 15, is we see that Habakkuk remembers. Habakkuk remembers one of the rhythms uh, of ancient culture was uh, they told stories. All their traditions were passed down orally. Some were written down, but they would always tell stories, right? They would pass down their history to one another through these things. And the people of God were no different. They told stories after generation to generation after generation after generation. And it's very difficult to tell stories in the nation of Israel and of people's God without telling stories of God's faithfulness and God's goodness and these unbelievable things that God did. You just can't communicate the story of God's people without it. And what we see in Habakkuk 3, verses 2 through 15, is a declaration of God's power, God's glory, and God's provision. And we see this as he references really specific events in the history of God's people. So let's go ahead and read uh, through Habakkuk 3, verses 1 through 15. The first one is, uh, 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 verse 1 says, A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, according to Shinnagonath. It says, O Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work. O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Timon and from the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like light raised, flashed from his hand, and there he veiled his power. Before him went pestilence and plague followed at his heels. He stood and measured the earth, and he looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered, and the everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. 
I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers or your indignation against the sea when you rode on your horses or your chariot of salvation? You stripped the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. The raging waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their place at the light of your arrows as they sped at the flash of your glittering spear. You marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. You pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters. These 15 verses, there's a certain poetry to them, right? It's very different than the, the tone and the tenor of what we saw in the first two chapters of Habakkuk. And what's the difference that we see here? In chapters 1 and chapters 2, Habakkuk had his eyes and his attention and his heart fixated on the problem. He was fixated out there. When God answered, Habakkuk turned. And what we see here, this declaration, is because now Habakkuk's got his eyes on God. He's gotten his eyes on God. He's gotten his eyes on God's glory, on God's power, and all the ways God has been faithful. His, his gaze has turned from the troubles of the nation of Judah, and it is on the God that he is speaking to. In verse 2, we see a statement that really sets up the prayer that comes after that. It says that he has heard of God's great deeds, and yes, he still feared what was coming, but he begins by begging God in his wrath to remember mercy. This word wrath there, uh, uh, if you translate it, it's really like the word agitation. So he's saying, God, in your anger, I know it's coming. We've talked about that. I remember your works. I do. But in your anger, please remember mercy. Scholars say that uh, verses 3 through 7 are... Um, what is known as a theophany, right? So it's a word that means a visible manifestation of God's power and God's glory, right? So we see this in Old Testament stories all the time, that God showed up visibly in person, in power, and Habakkuk begins to recount the ways that this happening. Habakkuk is remembering all the ways that God has been faithful to his people. In verse 4, Habakkuk remembers God's appearance and power at Mount Sinai. And clouds descended and lightning and thunder, God showed up. He remembers that. He remembers God's deliverance of his people from bondage in Egypt in verses 5 and verses 8. He remembers God commanding the sun and the moon to stand still as Joshua stood against the Amorites at Gibeon in verse 11. In verse 6, we see Habakkuk declare that God's power and glory are greater than the very foundations of the planet Earth and any nation that inhabits it. Look at what he said. It says, he, God, stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. He is remembering all of the things God did, all the ways God showed up, all the ways God moved in power, all the ways God was faithful to the promises he had made to his people. And he's declaring the power of God. Each and every verse is a declaration of God's power and a remembering of God's provision and deliverance of his people. That's why we say our hope is rooted in something. It has a foundation. Habakkuk, his prayer of hope is not wishful thinking. He is looking back at the history of God's people and how God has been faithful. You know, I think one of the things that we don't do a great job of, at least I don't, is looking back. I don't look back at my life. And usually when I do, it's to look back where I made a mistake. But I will tell you here that one of the postures that I think we see in this, and this is the first thing that I would tell you if you're right, taking notes, this is the first posture that we need to adopt, is that we need to remember God's past faithfulness, every bit of it. Every bit of it. 
We need to look back on our lives and remember how God's been good to us. We need to look back on our lives and remember all the moments where we thought things were going to go sideways, but God has come in to rescue and be faithful in those moments. We have to. It's the thing that we anchor ourselves in. It's the thing that we hold on to. In verse 13, Habakkuk declares that God went out for the salvation of his anointed, went out for the salvation of his people, and he crushed the head of the wicked. Habakkuk's prayer of hope is not wishful thinking. His hope is rooted in experience of God's faithfulness in the past. And because he has his eyes on God and not on his present circumstances, he is able to remember. Right? He's able to have his eyes fixed on God and see and remember the faithfulness of God. You know, it's important sometimes to not look at the circumstances, but to look to the thing that's going to overcome the circumstances. I'll give you an example. My grandparents uh, uh, lived in a small town in Louisiana, and their home was on a lake. It was called Black River Lake. It was a very um, uh, creative name because it was an oxbow off of the Black River. So they shut it off, Black River Lake, right? That's what it was. And I remember when I was probably six or seven years old, my dad, for the very first time, took me down to the dock of this lake, who I'd seen, and we kind of walked up to the edge of it, and he said, all right, buddy, jump in. And I looked at the water, and I looked back at him, and I was like, yeah, no, I don't think I'm going to do that. As I looked, I'll never forget, I looked, and the water was dark, and it was green, and it was murky, and you'd see a fish flop over here and a frog jump over there and maybe something happening out there, and all that was happening. If I could see all of that, then I know there's something terrible happening underneath that water, right? It's green and slimy and mossy, and I'm like, ain't no way I'm jumping in that water. I don't trust anything that's going on in there, and my dad was trying to urge me to do it, and I was like, nope, not happening. And then my dad uh, came to, they had a he used to water ski on that lake, so they had like a, almost like a pool ladder. And so he came around to the end of the pool and the ladder, and he climbed down, and he kind of swam back about three or four feet from the dock. And I remember standing at the edge, and I'm looking down, and I could hear my dad's voice going, come on, buddy, jump. You can do it. And I'm still looking frozen like, nope, there's a giant alligator under there that's going to eat me. I know it. <laughs> but then I remember the moment when I looked up, and I saw my dad's face, and he's swimming there. And he's in the water, and he's okay. And all the ways I trust my dad, that's my dad. He's my hero. He's my guy. I can trust him. And he's clapping his hands, and he's going, come on, buddy, you can do it. And I walked to the edge looking at my dad like this, and then I just jumped off. And hit the water, and lo and behold, nothing happened. Nothing bit me. Nothing stung me. Nothing ate me. I'm right here. I'm healthy. I'm good. We were having a good time, splishing and splashing. It was unbelievable. But when I stopped looking at the lake and I started looking at my dad, and I remember the ways my dad had been faithful and how I could trust my dad and how I could put my hope in that he was going to catch me and it was going to be okay. Doesn't mean there wasn't still stuff going on underneath the water. It just meant my focus wasn't on that. It was on that guy. Same for Habakkuk. When he got his eyes on the Lord, didn't mean his circumstances weren't still there. He's not praying this prayer of hope because God just took him away and they didn't exist. All the stuff that he's talked about in chapters 1 and 2 still going to happen. They're still terrible, but he can have hope because his hope for the future is rooted in God's faithfulness in the past. So when he got his eyes on God and God said, he, he remembered God's faithfulness and God's promises and God's provision, what happened? His prayer went from despair to hope. His declaration wasn't why God, but here we are. He was remembering God's faithfulness. He was remembering the promises that were made to God's people from the very beginning. If you go all the way back to Deuteronomy 31, 8, it says this, it is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. This is the promise that was given to God's people that Habakkuk is standing on. And he's looking at every moment that God had been faithful between that promise and the moment that he was standing in and he was going, I have to remember God's faithfulness. Remember the foundational statement of the book, the righteous will live by faith. That faith that we're, he's talking about, Habakkuk's talking about, is a constant and persistent, informed hope in the promises of God and God's faithfulness to fulfill them. It's not wish. 
My faith is not wishful thinking. It's not blind faith. It's an informed faith that is persistently and consistently filled with the hope that God will fulfill the promises that he has made. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. It's the assurance of things hoped for. Not crossing our fingers. We have hope today because God is faithful. We know God is faithful because God has always been faithful. Look at Hebrews. If you kept reading all the way through Hebrews 11th chapter, you see that hall of faith. You see uh, the writer of Hebrews talk about all the people who have been faithful to God. All of them. And how they were faithful to God and what happened. You know what many of them, what you see? Many of them never, they didn't live to see ultimately the promises of God fulfilled. But they were. And they were still faithful in those moments. Get to Hebrews 12, the first two verses says, Therefore, because we saw all that, and because faith is the assurance of things, of hope, therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, all remembering all the people that God's been faithful, we're surrounded by the witnesses, where they've witnessed it. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Here's my favorite part. Looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Believer, if you're in this room today, here's what I would tell you. You need not look any farther than to remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to find your hope. Your hope and your faith are rooted in the person of Jesus Christ. I can look back at my life and see all the ways God has been faithful. There's not one moment that displays God, God's faithfulness in my life more clearly than the cross of Christ. There is not one. It does not exist. We could, we, we should remember all of God's goodness. But I'll tell you this, I can go back to the moment of my salvation and at that moment I can trace God's faithfulness behind that that I never saw until that moment happened. And I could trace every moment God was faithful after that because now I, my, my vision, God had given me eyes to see his faithfulness and his work in his life. And if there's any of you in this room today that are going, I look back at my life and I've had some pretty good luck and I've worked really hard and I've done really good and things are going okay, a little bad sometimes, but we always make it through because we're hard workers. You need to look to the person of Christ. Those things will fail you. If I remember my effort, I remember failure. When I remember Jesus, I remember God's goodness and God's faithfulness. And there is no failure in that. Amen. If you look at your life and you say, Ben, I don't know if I have hope, real hope. I'm crossing my fingers. Then I would tell you this morning that you can have hope and his name is Jesus and you can know him today. Amen. Your hope is rooted in the fact that God manifested himself in the flesh on earth lived the life that you and I could never live, willingly gave himself up to brutal torture, death, shame on behalf of us, was buried, rose again three days later, and sits right now in the throne room of heaven interceding on behalf of his people. And he says to you, if you want to know hope, know me. Amen. And that gift is free to anyone in this room right now that doesn't know him. You just have to cry out and say, I'm tired of wishing, and I want to hope, and I need to know the person of Jesus Christ. That's the opportunity you have this morning. There is no greater display of God's power than the cross of Christ, and there is no greater display of God's faithfulness than the resurrection of Jesus to his people. It is the fulfillment of every promise God has ever made. Amen. And it's the reason that we get to experience what Habakkuk does next. Because if Habakkuk remembered first, the next thing he did was he rested. He rested. We get to verse 16 and we read, I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet, I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Habakkuk brought his complaints to God. 
God heard them. God responded. By the way, how grateful are you in this story that you got to see somebody bring their complaints to God and God didn't tell them to be quiet. God didn't tell them to not talk. God didn't tell me, I don't want to hear your mess. God listened. And then God responded. And then Habakkuk remembered. And because of all of that, now he can rest. Habakkuk's hope gives him rest, not because it's uninformed, but because it is informed by the faithfulness of God. When we look back at the goodness and faithfulness of God in our life, it produces a rest for our spirit that can come from nowhere else. From nowhere else, because it's not a wish. He has remembered God's promises. He's remembered his faithfulness and his faithfulness to fulfill every promise he's ever made to the people of God since the beginning of time. Habakkuk describes his fear and trembling of what's to come. He describes his fear and trembling of the situation he's in. He's still in this place where it doesn't mean the fear is gone, doesn't mean the anxiety is gone, doesn't mean the worry has dissipated, right? But because he's remembered God's faithfulness, that faithfulness has overwhelmed everything else, and he's able to say, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. He knows that Judah's sinfulness must be dealt with, and he knows that there will be rescue also. And he knows that that's not coming anytime soon. Remember he told me you have to wait on the Lord. And knowing all of that, he says, I'll wait quietly. I'll quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invaded us. Habakkuk is resting in God's past faithfulness as he waits patiently on God's future provision. And that's the second posture that we have to adopt in our life. We have to rest in God's future provision provision. Because when we remember God's past, past faithfulness, we can rest in God's future provision. Amen. found it interesting that the word quietly in uh, verse 16, the root word is translated as the word sigh, S-I-G-H. It can also be translated as to patiently expect something. I always envision Habakkuk writing this, and Habakkuk said, it's coming, it's coming, we're in trouble, and God's going to deal with us, and he's going to deal with us harshly, and he's going to come back, and he's going to deal with the wickedness of the Babylonians, and he's going to rescue us, and he is going to judge them. That promise is, is true right now because all his other promises have been true. Everyone he's ever made that I imagine back at you going, so I'll wait patiently for the day of trouble to come on those who invade us. This giant sigh of relief. Quietly doesn't mean sitting there with his mouth shut. Quietly means he can go, he can breathe. I can rest and wait patiently. What we'll see next week, we'll talk about for waiting for God's people is not just sitting on the couch waiting. There's a, there's a way that we wait as God's people, and we'll talk a little bit about that next week, but I love the idea of this moment after all this despair and all this anxiety and all this angst and all this wrestling with God, this moment where Habakkuk remembers all that God's done and he just sighs and goes, yep, because he was faithful in the past, I can trust in his provision in the future so I can rest. I can wait patiently, quietly. And that connects all the way back to verse 2. Because if we look all the way back in verse 2, one of the things that Habakkuk prayed for was that God would revive his mighty works. He says, O oh Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work. O oh Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember, in anger, remember mercy. That sigh of relief is trusting that God is going to do exactly what Habakkuk prayed for him to do. Bring revival to the people of God. Deal with the wickedness of the world. And we are going to experience mercy from God. Habakkuk had seen the people of God turn back. He had seen revival come to the nation before under the reign of King Josiah. And he was asking God to do that again. Even though he knew that there would be difficult times and things required to get there. How many of you would say, my prayer is that God would bring revival? Yeah. Bring revival. You realize that that prayer comes with some difficult things that might happen to achieve it. Do you envision for a moment if you're in agriculture 
or if you own a piece of land and that land has become overgrown with invasive species of weeds and insects and all that stuff, right? It's, it's uninhabitable. It's unusable. You can't grow anything on it. You can't use it for anything. There are moments where people that own pieces of land like that will do a controlled burn on that land, right? They'll define an area. They'll set it up, and they'll light it on fire. And they'll consume every rotten thing, every pest, every weed, every tree, everything that's killing and choking the life out of that piece of land, and they'll burn it to ash. You've know, ever seen them, right? You've seen a black piece of land. It could be acres. It could be acres and acres of land. Why do they do that? Because they know what happens after you burn that, and that fertilizes the soil that's underneath it, and it gets to rest, and it's not being stressed, and it's not being strained, that new growth comes from that, right? Had to burn it down so that it would grow again. This is what Habakkuk is praying for. And it's an odd moment to realize that he's resting in something that's going to be harmful and it's going to be hard and it's going to be difficult for the people of God. And it's certainly going to be difficult for people that don't know God. But Habakkuk rests anyway, even though he prayed for God to do the great things he had done before because God know, he knows that God brings mercy to his people. And from the hardship of God's people will come new growth. It will come revival. They'll turn back to God. And certainly if you read uh, further on in the Bible and you read about the Babylonian captivity, you see that very thing happening. It's easy for us to look out at the landscape of the world and ask the same question as Habakkuk, right? It's easy to look outside of this building and go, God, where are you? Where are you? Where are you in the, in the sin and in the struggle and in all the terrible circumstances? You don't have to throw a baseball very hard to hit something or someone that is struggling through something unbelievably difficult. You don't have to point your finger in any direction to find something that you can go, man, I wish God would fix that. I wish he would deal with that. And I would tell you this morning that our answer is the same answer that Habakkuk got. The righteous live by faith. Amen. I'm doing something. Trust me. Keep your eyes on me. Don't, don't, don't be focused and fixated on all that's wrong in the world. Know that I'm coming. Know that I'm going to deal with it. Know that I am faithful because I've always been faithful. Keep your eyes on me. Last, work, last week I said that the, the hope for the world is spiritual awakening. I believe that. The hope for this world is spiritual awakening. The hope for these people in this room, spiritual awakening. The hope for this church that is New Beginnings, spiritual awakening. The hope for Upshur County, the hope for Texas, the hope for the United States, the hope for the world, the hope for the universe is spiritual awakening. There is no other hope. Nothing short of that will do. It is the only thing that matters. And as we remember God's faithfulness in the past, we will find rest in God's promise of future provision. And in that, our prayer should be the same as Habakkuk's. God, revive us. God, I have remembered your goodness. And God, I'm resting and trusting in your faithfulness and provision in the future. But God, revive us. Bring revival. Burn what you've got to burn. Do what you've got to do. But make it new. Fix it. Show us your glory. Today, I want every one of us in this room to have hope and not a flimsy, cross your fingers, wishful thinking kind of hope, a hope that exists in spite of your circumstances. And I don't say that lightly because I know that many of you are dealing with circumstances that are very difficult. But I will tell you that the hope we have in Jesus transcends every one of them. Hope in spite of anything going on in this world politically or societally. And trust me, over the last week or so, if you've watched any bit of news, the one thing you couldn't say is, man, I got a lot of hope in that. <laughs> Here's the good news. I never had to. I never had to have hope in some political candidate or economic policy or a bill to be passed or a judge to be elected, none of those things. I don't, I don't put my hope in any of those things. I look at those things happening and recognize that God's going to use them for his glory and for the expansion of his kingdom because my hope is in God and not in man and not in this world. I want you to have hope despite culture fighting with everything that it is against the kingdom of God. 
The more you pursue him, the more it pushes back. And the culture will never stop doing that. But believer, hear me. Even if you don't live to see it come true, you can have hope that God will prevail over that. And we will stand victorious with Jesus when he comes back to make all things new if you belong to him. I want you to have hope. I want you to have hope because you can trace the faithfulness of God's hand in your life. You can see God's goodness in your life and in the lives of those around you. I want you to have hope because you can say, I know Jesus. That's my hope. We can pursue Jesus no matter what it costs because our hope is in the Lord and in nothing else. And if you're in here today and you have placed your hope anywhere but there, then you're in trouble. If you want to look back and remember God's faithfulness in your life, we want to rest in God's future provision. We want our hope to be in that the Lord is who he says that he is. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, even when we are faithless, God is faithful, for he cannot deny himself. You realize that, right? God can't be anything but faithful. So if you're not experiencing God or you're not seeing God's faithfulness in your life, it's not because God isn't being faithful. We can rest in the faithfulness and in the goodness and in the hope we find in the Lord because God has redeemed us if we belong to him and ultimately he will rescue us from all of this. God will redeem his creation. Every promise you can read in this book, every one of them have either come true or coming true or will come true. And you can have faith in that and you can have hope that that's going to happen because it will, because it always has. So as we close, there's a couple of ways I think that we can deal with this idea of of a prayer of hope. And for God's people, we need to pray. We need to pray. We pray two things. First thing is we need to give God thanks. We need to declare his glory. We need to declare his goodness by declaring his faithfulness in our life and the good deeds he's done. God, thank you. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for healing my marriage. Thank you for uh, curing and and, and alleviating this addiction. Thank you for sustaining me during these financial difficult times. Thank you for doing all of those things. And God, because I know that you've done them, I'm going to pray that you'll keep doing them because I got this thing in my life that's going on now too. We need to declare God's faithfulness so that we can rest in his future goodness. And then we need to pray for revival. As I said, how many of you would say you're going to pray for revival? A lot of nodding heads. Those nodding heads need to be praying praying people. You need to beg God in his wrath, remember mercy. Revive the works you've done. All the awesome things we read in the Bible that God's done. All the awesome things you've seen God do in your life. All the awesome things you've seen God do in this church and on our Longview campus and all around the world. You need to pray, God, do it again. Do it again now. We need you. Revive us. So I would call you to pray. At your seat, with your family, at this altar, with your spouse, on your knees before God, going, God, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I know that you can because you have. Thank you for doing it before, and I'm begging you to do it again. I think it's, but I also think it's difficult to remember God's faithfulness and to rest in his future provision if you haven't experienced his salvation. I think it's easy to discount things in our life as good luck or as effort because we haven't placed our trust and hope in the one from which all of it comes and that's Jesus so if you're in the room today and you heard me talking about what it means to know Jesus and you say I don't know if I have hope my heart desperately wants you to have hope this morning and that comes from Jesus Christ and it is simple the book of John says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart God raised him from the dead you're what You're saved. And in that moment, you're given a hope that will never fail, that can never be untarnished, never be tarnished, that can never be diminished, 
You read about Habakkuk talking about the brightness of God was like light, rays flash from his hand, and there he veiled his power. All of these Old Testament displays of God's power, that is your experience in Christ Jesus, that he pulls you from darkness into light. Does that mean that your struggle goes away? No. Does it mean that your life won't be difficult sometimes? No. But it means you don't have to jump in the water alone. It means you can look in the face of your Savior and he's going, come on, it's going to be okay. You can do it. And that's what he's saying to somebody in this room right now. So in a moment, we're going to pray and our staff and our elders will be down front. And when we do, if that's the decision that you've made today or you need to make, then as soon as we stand up, I need you to come down here and grab somebody by the hand so that you can know hope for the rest of you, let's just pray. This altar is nothing special. God God doesn't hear prayers from here any better than he hears them from your seat. But in my heart, there's something specific that happens when I get up out of my seat and I move to a place and I hit my knees and I humble myself before God and I say, God, I need you to do them. And there's something really significant and special that happens in the life of people when everybody does it. So I'm going to pray, and we're going to stand, and we're going to worship, and we're going to respond. And I would ask that you would allow the Holy Spirit to guide you and dictate how you would respond in these next few moments and not worry about what's going on anywhere else, but just look at the face of God. Just look at, the, look at your Savior's eyes. Look at the face of God. Trust in his faithfulness. Thank him for it. Rest in his provision. Call out to his name for it. Find hope. Jesus, we love you. Lord, I'm grateful for the hope that's found in your faithfulness, Lord. Grateful for the hope that I know in my Savior, Jesus, Lord. And I pray that today what we would experience is hope. It's a hope that is not based in anything other than you, Lord. Give us hearts of joy and thankfulness to thank you for all the ways you've been faithful in the past, Lord. Allow us to bring our needs to you now, Lord. Trusting and hope, our hope is in that you will be faithful in the future, Lord. And if anyone doesn't know you, God, I pray that you would call them into hope this morning, Lord. We trust you with everything, God, and we need your Holy Spirit to move, Father. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As you look up, why don't you go ahead and stand up and let's worship and respond.